Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Joffrey Ola. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon at uh, Chalk Children's Hospital. And today I'm going to talk about minimally invasive uh, epilepsy uh, surgery and uh, neuromodulation uh, for the treatment of ep epilepsy. Uh, so as, as we all know, there are uh, lots of different causes uh, for, for epilepsy. Uh, there are genetic causes, uh, such as um, uh, SCN1A mutation uh, that can cause Dravet syndrome uh, and affects voltage-gated uh, sodium channels and many other uh, underlying uh, genetic conditions. Uh, sometimes epilepsy can be due to brain injury, such as um, from uh, a stroke, um, trauma, um, uh, and other things. Uh, and then occasionally uh, epilepsy can be secondary to a brain malformation, like a um, cortical malformation or hemimegencephaly uh, or um, Sturge-Weber. Uh, so lo lots of different things can, uh, can cause it. Uh, and uh, uh, but, but we also know that most of the time we, we don't know what causes it. Um, it's been uh, said that up to six out of 10 uh, cases are uh, of patients that have epilepsy. We don't have an underlying uh, etiology. Uh, we have uh, different treatment options for epilepsy. Uh, the most common treatment is a medication. Uh, we, we can also, uh, in some patients, uh, try a ketogenic diet. And then for those patients who don't respond uh, to these treatments, we can try uh, uh, surgery. Uh, medications uh, work pretty well uh, overall. Uh, in general, they control uh, uh, seizures in seven out of 10 people. Uh, but you have to make sure that you are taking the medications as prescribed uh, to, to make sure you get the full uh, benefit of those uh, drugs. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, about uh, a third of patients that have epilepsy uh, go on to become uh, refractory or, or develop an intractable epilepsy, uh, which means that the seizures are, are not able to be controlled with medication. So in general, if somebody has tried two, or, uh, uh, two seizure medications at the proper uh, um, uh, doses uh, and continues to have uh, epilepsy, then that's considered to, uh, to be refractory epilepsy or intractable epilepsy. That's when we start uh, considering uh, uh, surgical uh, treatment options because we know that uh, uh, trying a third, uh, fourth, fifth medication to, to try to control the epilepsy has less than a five or 10% chance of, of getting those seizures under control. Um, in, in order to determine if somebody is an epilepsy surgery candidate, we do an extensive uh, workup, uh, including an EEG or a VTM, a long term uh, uh, monitoring. Uh, we I perform a brain MRI to see if there's an underlying uh, a structural abnormality uh, in the brain that could be causing the seizures. Uh, we can also get other studies such as a PET scan or a MEG scan or a SPEC scan. And these are all different types of studies to again try to pinpoint exactly where the seizures are coming from. Because if we can figure out where the seizures are coming from, then potentially we could treat that area um, uh, with, with, different, uh, with different therapies. Uh, we also, uh, as part of the, the epilepsy surgery workup, we also get neuropsychiatric testing because sometimes that can also give us a clue as to um, uh, parts of the brain that may already uh, be uh, uh, affected from the epilepsy. And then it can also uh, help us uh, know what potential deficits um, we may uh, need to look out for, or monitor for um, after surgery, depending on which part of the brain is, is affected. Once we have all of this data, uh, then we present it at our uh, epilepsy surgery conference. And at the conference, we have neurosurgery, uh, uh, neurology, or uh, the epileptologist. Uh, we have um, the neuropsychologist, uh, the radiologist. And we have all, all the different speci uh, specialists and all the team members. Uh, and we review all of this data together. Uh, and once we review the data, then we determine if, if someone is a, uh, a candidate for epilepsy surgery or not. Now, uh, epilepsy surgery um, is a broad term. It can mean lots of different things. Um, it could mean just uh, uh, getting, uh, doing a, a procedure or surgery to get more information. Doesn't necessarily mean it, it's to treat it, uh, treat the epilepsy. So, for example, if we do an EEG and we monitor uh, um, this uh, electrical activity through the uh, electrodes on the scalp, and we see that the seizures appear to be coming from a certain part of the brain, um, uh, we may not still have enough information to determine if, if we can then go and resect that area or treat that area. So sometimes we need to place electrodes directly in the brain to get a, a, a better uh, idea of where those seizures are coming from. Because the electrical activity spreads so quickly, sometimes, uh, for example, if the seizures are coming from the, temp uh, from the frontal lobes, uh, if it's, if it's uh, starting from a deep uh, uh, structure in the frontal lobe, because it takes time for that seizure to spread out through the brain and to, uh, to reach the, the scalp electrodes, uh, sometimes it, it's hard to determine whether it's coming from truly coming from the right side or the left side. And so placing electrodes directly in the brain can help uh, clarify uh, that issue 
and then hopefully um, give us the opportunity to, to treat that specific area. A surgery obviously can also entail uh, resecting uh, the part of the brain that, that's causing the seizure and taking that out or, or disconnecting a part of the brain where the seizures are coming from or doing a disconnection from one side to the other. Uh, one of the, the, the largest disconnection that we can do is what's called the hemispherectomy or hemispherotomy where we uh, disconnect one entire hemisphere uh, um, from, uh, that, that's causing seizures from the healthy part of the brain so that the seizures don't spread to, to the, healthy, uh, the healthy brain. Um, now this is obviously done in a patient that has very diffuse process that's affecting an entire uh, half of, of the brain. Um, now, now these are more extensive procedures, but uh, sometimes we can try to do less invasive procedures or minimally uh, invasive procedures uh, such as laser ablation. Uh, and in this procedure, instead of uh, making an incision, opening up the skin and the, the bone and uh, um, getting into the brain to resect a, a specific part of the brain, we can actually just make a small little incision, place a probe, down to the area of concern, down to the target, and then we can uh, uh, ablate or burn that tissue, um, essentially like uh, taking it out, but without actually having to open up the, the skull. So it's a nice, uh, less in, minimally invasive way to, to treat a very focal epilepsy, meaning the, uh, epilepsy that's coming from a specific part of the, um, the brain. Uh, other options that we have um, include neuromodulation. Uh, now, neuromodulation is a broad term that, again, it, it includes many different devices, including the VNS, uh, the RNS and the DBS, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in detail um, uh, further along in the talk. Um, now, typically for, for surgery, uh, you know, our goals are to, um, you know, make it as, uh, as, as safe as possible and as toler and, and, and try to ensure that the patients are able to tolerate uh, the, the procedures as best as possible. So we, our goals are to make smaller incisions, uh, cause uh, less pain, um, uh, minimize the blood loss, uh, decrease the hospital stay, and overall, just uh, decrease the recovery time so that our, our patients can go back to their normal lives um, as, as soon as possible. Uh, so in terms of invasive monitoring, where we're gathering more data to, to again, try to find where the seizures are coming from, from within the brain, uh, there's uh, two main ways that we do that. So one is uh, by performing a, a, a craniotomy, again, opening up the skin and the bone, and then placing grid uh, electrodes, electrodes directly on the brain, um, and then tunneling the wires of those electrodes out through the skin and then closing everything up and then capturing seizures. And then once we capture the seizures, the epileptologist review the data. And then again, they can pinpoint exactly what part of the brain is causing, or where, where the, uh, they can pinpoint where the seizures are coming from, what part of the brain the seizures are coming from. Then once we have that information, then we can go in, we can take, remove the electrodes uh, and then uh, potentially remove uh, or, or resect that part of the brain that's causing seizures. Now, another uh, way that we can monitor invasively or inside of the brain is by uh, doing what's called SEEG or serotactic uh, EEG. And so, uh, again, the idea is that um, we place electrodes directly within the brain tissue, and, uh, and then we monitor for, for seizures. And then once uh, we capture seizures, then again, the epileptologist can review the data and then again, pinpoint what part of the brain the seizure is coming from. And so, uh, one way that we do that is um, uh, by placing these depth electrodes using uh, the, um, the ROSA robot. So you can see here on the left side of the screen, uh, these are what the electrodes uh, look like. So these thin little wires. And then at the end, you see these uh, um, uh, contacts here, and that's the part of the electrode that's recording the electrical activity. And then this then gets sent out through the skin and then gets connected uh, to the EET machine. On the uh, right hand of the screen, uh, we can see uh, this is a, a, a patient uh, um, that's getting a, an, uh, in the process of getting electrode placed. And so we can see the, the ROSA robot, the, the robot is here in the background. And so that robot um, helps us uh, plan exactly the, the entry point and the target for where we're gonna place these electrodes uh, to capture more data. And so uh, prior to surgery, uh, we, we obtain imaging, including an MRI and a CT scan. Uh, and then we load that imaging into the um, ROSA um, computer system. And then we can plan exactly where we want to place the electrodes, depending on what the hypothesis is of where the seizures are coming from. Um, and so the, the goal is to place the electrodes uh, in, uh, through safe spaces and, and try to avoid hitting any blood vessels, because obviously we don't want to cause any significant uh, bleeding. Uh, and so the, the ROSA uh, robot is able to um, show us the entry point. Uh, and so you can see here um, the um, the cannula is right at the entry point. Then we just make a, a small two, three millimeter incision uh, through the skull, uh, uh, I'm sorry, through the scalp, and then we make a small opening through the skull uh, with the drill. 
Uh, and then once we um, make a, uh, the opening, then we place a little bolt uh, and secure that to the uh, scalp. Uh, then we uh, place a, a stylet all the way down to the target. So the, the machine actually tells us how deep um, to, to go. And we place the stylet all the way down to the target. And then um, we pull that out and then we place the actual electrode and then secure that to, to the scalp. So this is what the uh, instrumentation looks like uh, in the operating room. Uh, so again, you can see the patient in the background, uh, and then you can see the table um, here that includes the um, uh, the the bolts um, here, uh, which are what are secured to this uh, to the skull uh, to ensure that the, the leads don't move once they're placed. Uh, we can see this is the screwdriver that helps to secure the um, the bolt in place. Uh, this is the stylet that helps create the trajectory, and then we place the um, the wire all the way down to uh, the target. These are the little caps that we put on top of the bolt to, to hold everything in place. Um, and this is an image uh, that's done after the procedure. And so you can see, um, again, by making uh, several uh, small uh, incisions throughout the, the, the scalp, we can place uh, multiple electrodes all throughout the, uh, um, uh, the brain and to be able to capture um, the electrical activity more directly within the brain tissue. And again, try to isolate and find where the seizures are, are coming from. Uh, and then now once we get that information, uh, then uh, potentially if we, we find that the seizures are coming from a very focal area, a very uh, localized area, uh, then sometimes we can then treat that um, again in a minimally invasive fashion uh, by uh, using laser ablation. Uh, so the idea behind laser ablation is that we can uh, burn uh, the tissue that's causing the seizures, uh, ablate it, and you get it to a certain temp temperature that uh, uh, eventually causes cellular death. And so then that tissue is non-functional. And so where, as before, uh, there was abnormal electrical activity coming from there and then spreading and causing seizures, um, uh, if you burn that tissue, then that, then that area is not able to cause seizures anymore. And so this is an illustration so showing what, uh, what that looks like. So this is the patient that's uh, laying down uh, inside the MRI uh, scanner. So this is the, the tube in here. Uh, this is the patient's head. Um, and then you can see here, this is after the patient has had uh, similar to with the SEG, where we place the, the bolt and secure that to the skull. Uh, then with the ROSA uh, uh, system, we can also plan um, where we can put the, the, the depth elect or the um, laser probe, um, and we, we calculate how, how deep to go. And so then this is the patient that has the bolt in place, and we have the attachment for, for the uh, laser here. And then this is the laser probe here. And then you can see here, as we uh, insert it all the way down to the target. So again, this is after we figured out where the um, seizures are coming from. And then we uh, can place the, the probe all the way down to target, and then we can heat up the tissue. Now, this is a, a probe. There's different types of probes, different sizes of probes, depending on what the lesion looks like and what we want to target. And so um, in, in this uh, uh, instance here, this is a, what's called a side fire probe. So it's, it's um, spreading the heat in, in a certain direction that you can rotate um, the probe to, to um, heat uh, the specific area you want to heat. Uh, there's also what's called a full fire probe where it basically heats all circumferentially all, all around uh, and then you can heat the tissue and then you can pull the probe back and then uh, continue heating the tissue uh, that you want to uh, ablate. And so this is what, uh, this is just an example of an area that, that's been ablated. Um, so this here is a picture of a patient who had a, a laser ablation done um, at CHOC. So, and this, this is an MRI image after the ablation. And so in, in, in this uh, image here, you can see the patient is uh, lying down facing up. Uh, so we can see the, the eyes are up here. Uh, there's the nose, um, there's the back of the head. Uh, so if you imagine the patient's lying down uh, with the head towards the monitor and the feet out towards us, and we're looking at different slices and we can go up and down. So this is actually the right side of the patient here. And this is the left side of the patient here. And then here you can see that dark line. Uh, that's the trajectory of where the, the uh, laser probe um, uh, was going. Uh, and then here, this enhancement, this bright area uh, around here, that's um, after the, uh, the ablation has been completed, it, it shows uh, the area that, that's been treated or ablated um, to, to help uh, stop the seizure. So this particular patient had um, a seizures coming from uh, the, the, what's called the amygdala and the hippocampus, which is this middle uh, a temporal area. So this is the temporal lobe here. It's kind of this middle uh, area here. Uh, and so we were able to ablate um, uh, that area, and then the seizures that were previously coming from that area uh, were uh, um, stopped, and the, and the patient no longer had seizures coming from that area. Uh, so that, that treatment worked well. Uh, now, this is a, another example of a patient that I treated um, almost a couple years ago now. Um, and uh, this is a patient that, um, again, had the SEG electrodes placed, so all the electrodes placed uh, um, throughout the brain. 
And then we found that the seizures were coming from a part of the brain um, called the uh, anterior cingulate. Um, and so if you look at the MRI here, this is uh, kind of a side view here. Uh, so this is the, the forehead this way, and then the back of the head is over here. Uh, this part of the brain here is called the corpus callosum. And the cingulate gyrus is the, the, the tissue that goes right above the corpus uh, callosum there. And so anyways, we placed uh, electrodes and we found that the seizures were coming from this anterior uh, cingulate area here. Uh, and then we, we saw that then it would spread to the next contact that was here in the middle cingulate and then go to the posterior cingulate. So the seizures are starting here and spreading in this direction. And so the idea behind this ablation was that we, we, we placed the electrode coming in this direction so we could uh, burn the tissue and then we could pull the probe back a little bit and then burn more tissue and then pull it back a little bit and burn more tissue so that we can uh, ablate the, the anterior um, cingulate heading towards the, the middle cingulate uh, so that we can stop the seizure and then stop the spread of the seizures uh, going along that area. Now, this is actually the imaging that I, I, I can see um, in the middle of the um, surgery uh, when I'm doing the procedure. Uh, and so this is after the patient has had the laser, uh, the, the bolt placed, and then the patient goes down to MRI. And then the MRI, like I showed in the uh, pre previous um, video, uh, the, the, this is the actual probe in the brain. And then we can see the, 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 the tissue being heated up. And so the yellow outline uh, there uh, shows tissue that's being been heated to a point where the tissue is denatured. So it's not functioning well, um, uh, but it's not completely um, uh, destroyed. And then uh, the blue outline there, uh, that's where the, the tissue had gotten to the point of cellular death. So it, it's uh, irreversible uh, cell damage. So at that point, that tissue is non-functional anymore. So if there were seizures that were originating from there, they shouldn't be able to originate anymore because that, those cells aren't, aren't working anymore. So it's like having resected it without actually having to open up the skull and take out that area, but instead just burning or, uh, or treating that, that specific focus. And so um, again, this is a video showing as, uh, as we're ablating the tissue along that, uh, that cingulate gyrus. Uh, and then again, we burn uh, uh, one part of it, then we pull back a little bit. The, the laser machine actually has a robot so we can you know, tell it to move back five millimeters and then it'll ablate more tissue and then pull back a little bit more until we get the, the desired um, treatment uh, area. And so here, this is the, the final image. So again, looking uh, from the side, you can see the forehead is here. This is the back of the head. And then you can see this area here is the area that was, uh, that was ablated. Um, this is be looking kind of head on, uh, kind of similar. You can see how it's kind of deep medial, uh, kind of a, a frontal area here. Um, and then this, again, the, the last image showed the, the yellow um, a denatured area. And then this is the area uh, that, uh, that's highlighted in blue is, is that tissue is completely destroyed. So theoretically, seizures shouldn't be coming from that area anymore. And so uh, this particular patient um, uh, it did very well afterwards. Um, the patient was actually seizure free. Um, for, for about six months and was doing really well. Um, but, but unfortunately, uh, then the, the patient ended up having seizures, um, started having a few, a few seizures again. And so, you know, we knew that we were uh, in the area uh, of interest because obviously the seizure stopped after we, we treated the area. But again, as we talked about, initially when we burned the tissue, um, it, uh, it denatures the tissue, so it's not functioning well, but theoretically it's not it, the, the part that's surrounded by yellow means that the tissue is not completely de uh, destroyed. And so after the swelling goes down, after things kind of heal, there's always a possibility that if some of the surrounding tissue was still involved with the seizures, that seizures could still uh, persist. And so um, obviously uh, our, our goal is always to get the seizures under control uh, um, you know, as best as possible and, and, and do it under one treatment. But I, I presented this case just to show that in some cases, even after we do surgery, sometimes seizures could still uh, persist. But that doesn't mean that we don't have other options. So the nice thing about the, the laser ablation is that even if we did this and then the, the seizures uh, 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 returned, we always have the option of going back and then doing the standard uh, craniotomy and resection and remo removing that specific uh, part, part of the brain. Uh, but, uh, but in this case, actually, we, we decided not to do that. Because again, since she did so well with the minimally invasive procedure and we knew that we're, we're right at the area, close to the area, um, but just didn't get um, all of it, that we could probably do a similar procedure and, and hopefully get a good, uh, good results after that. So um, this is just a picture just showing how the procedure is minimally invasive. This is a, an image uh, one week uh, after surgery. You can see there's just one little stitch there. Um, you, know, you can barely tell that that uh, patient had, had any surgery or procedure at all. Um, and, again, and again, with these procedures, as I mentioned, they're minimally invasive. So patients have the, the procedure done. Uh, they stay in the ICU maybe overnight. 
and, and most patients go home uh, the next day. So it's, it's very well uh, tolerated. Again, small incision, uh, minimal uh, uh, blood loss, minimal pain, mi minimal hospital stay. So uh, it's, it's a very nice uh, option. But obviously our, our goal is to uh, completely control the seizures as, as best as possible. And so you know, when we, we have recurrent seizures, then we have to think about other uh, uh, potential options. Uh, so in this case, what we did is we went back and looked at all of the data. Uh, we got the MRI, we registered it with um, the, the preoperative uh, imaging, with the postoperative imaging. We, uh, we overlaid um, the imaging that had the electrodes in place with the uh, imaging that had the ablation in place. Uh, we did uh, some 3D uh, modeling um, here uh, to, to really uh, pinpoint exactly which contacts the seizures were coming from, which contacts were, were uh, ablated, and see if maybe there was some overlap there that didn't quite get treated as, as well as we would have liked. And so uh, looking at all the data um, after uh, doing all, all, um, uh, all of these reconstructions, you know, we saw that, uh, again, the, uh, the uh, initial SEG electrode was here in the anterior area, which is what we expected. The laser ablation uh, was this, uh, here highlighted in, in yellow. So we treated the area that we wanted to treat. And again, the idea was to treat kind of going posteriorly because we knew that the seizure started here and spread in that, in that direction. And so we wanted to um, stop the, uh, the network uh, as seizures uh, pro uh, pro uh, progressed. And, um, uh, but, but unfortunately, it, did, it seemed like there was still some tissue probably just around here that was uh, just enough to continue to cause seizures. And maybe there was a little bit of tissue kind of to the middle part here that we didn't quite, quite capture um, by getting the trajectory coming from, from the top uh, down. So again, we presented all of the information in our epilepsy uh, surgery conference. Uh, and again, because our goal is to try to get the seizure under control as best as possible, uh, you know, we, we were trying to uh, figure out what, what else we could do to help with the seizures. And so uh, the option that we came up with was that um, to go back and, and do another uh, laser ablation, uh, again, since you tolerate it so well the first time. Uh, but this time, instead of having the trajectory coming from the top uh, down uh, to, to that uh, cingulate, we decided to, to take a different trajectory and come from the side and then go, uh, go in. And that way we could get more of this middle uh, tissue here. Um, and then we could also uh, extend uh, the ablation a little bit more anteriorly uh, here. And so uh, this is a, a, an image of uh, the... Um, uh, in, in the procedure where the laser probe is going uh, directly into where the prior ablation was, and it's just a little bit more anterior. Um, and then this is a, a, an MRI done after the ablation. So again, the initial ablation was this area here. Uh, oops. And then uh, this dark spot here is where we targeted where the initial SEG electrode was, was placed. And then we could, uh, we then ablated uh, circumferentially. So all the way around here to again, uh, get a little bit more, more tissue ablated uh, more in front of the prior ablation and more towards the middle of the ablation. Um, and again, the, the procedure went very well. Uh, the patient was only in the hospital for a day. Again, small, small incision, uh, minimal uh, pain, minimal blood loss. Uh, patient, patient went home uh, the following day. And uh, now this has been almost a year now. And the patient has been uh, seizure free. And so again, you know, uh, obviously we always want the, the best outcome after just one, one procedure. But the, the reason why I highlighted this specific case was that you know, um, the nice thing about these minimally invasive procedures is that it still gives us the option of potentially uh, um, going back and treating again if the seizures are not completely uh, controlled uh, the first time, uh, either um, the, uh, doing another uh, laser ablation like we did in this case, and unfortunately in this case it worked well, um, or we could always do the standard uh, craniotomy uh, where we do the opening and then remove that, that specific part of the brain um, to, to hopefully get the seizure under better control. So in this case, we were able to get a, a very good outcome um, you know, with, with the second ablation. Uh, ideally, we would have wanted to get it all the, the first time, um, but, uh, but overall, uh, even with the two uh, procedures, uh, she was in the hospital less time, uh, had less, uh, you know, blood loss and, and, and uh, pain than she would have had if we would have initially done a big craniotomy uh, up front. So I think this is still a, a nice option. Uh, it's a good, um, a, a good uh, a case to demonstrate how when the seizures are coming from a focal area, we can treat it with these less invasive um, a, a treatment option. Uh, another procedure that, that we do um, to help uh, treat epilepsy is uh, something that's called the corpus uh, callosotomy. And so uh, the corpus callosum is, a, um, a, is one of the main connections from, for the two hemispheres, the two sides of the brain. And so we can see here, this is a view looking from the side. This is an MRI. Uh, you can see the nose is here. Here's the forehead. There's the back of the head. And you see that the brain tissue is up here. This is the cerebellum. 
Uh, this is the brain stem here. Uh, the black space is the spinal fluid around the brain. Uh, and then this white structure that you see here, this is the corpus uh, callosum. So again, it's one of the big, big connections from, from the right to the left um, uh, hemispheres. Uh, and then this is a, a patient that I brought on uh, probably six, seven years ago um, who had a, a, a craniotomy for corpus callosotomy. So again, you know, we made an incision, uh, opened up the bone, and then we went in between the two hemispheres. We would have two hemispheres in order to go in between uh, to get down um, into that structure, and then we resected um, that, that corpus callosum. And so you can see here, this is a post-operative uh, MRI that was done, so you no longer see that corpus uh, callosum there. That, that, that white area now is, uh, represents the dark space here, and, and dark, again, is spinal fluid. So basically fluid just kind of filled in that space. And so uh, corpus callosotomies are not um, typically curative procedures um, because again, these are for patients that have um, lots of seizures coming from lots of different areas, but they spread very quickly from one side to the other. So the idea behind doing a corpus callosotomy is to help decrease the spread uh, and, and uh, to, to overall help control the seizure. So it doesn't take away all the seizures, but it helps decrease the, um, uh, the severity and, and, and the frequency and the spread, which leads to, um, in many cases, drop, uh, drop attacks. You can have drop seizures. And so this, uh, this type of procedure helps uh, with those types of uh, patients. Um, and so again, the, the standard way to do this was with an um, open cr uh, craniotomy um, uh, to resect the, the, the corpus callosum. Uh, but now with uh, laser ablation, uh, uh, we, we have the option to do that procedure in a, in a minimally invasive uh, fashion as well. And so again, here's an MRI looking from the side with the forehead here, the back of the head here. Again, you guys can see the uh, corpus callosum here. And now because the corpus callosum is a C-shaped structure and the laser is a straight uh, probe, um, obviously we can't get um, the, the, the whole corpus callosum with one trajectory. So in this case, um, in order uh, to get the, the entire corpus callosum for this patient, we plan three different trajectories. So you can see here the, um, the, the purple line, the green line, the blue line. And these are different trajectories that, that we took uh, in order to, to be able to ablate the entire corpus callosum. So, um, this is a 3D uh, a reconstruction here. And these are images, again, from the, the ROSA um, uh, workstation that I have, uh, so I can plan exactly where to go in and where to target uh, to be able to, um, to, to burn the, the, the tissue with the laser. And so these are the, the three different trajectories. This is an intraoperative uh, picture. So again, this, we're on the operating room here. Uh, the, the ROSA machine is here. And then we can see here, these are the bolts that, again, are secured into the skull uh, in the appropriate uh, trajectory to get down to the, to the corpus callosum. Um, and so again, once the, the bolts are placed, the patient's taken down to MRI, and then we place the, um, the probe all the way down to target. So you can see the probe uh, going all the way down here. You can see that the blue outline is uh, tissue that's being heated. So this is the actual um, image um, I done uh, here um, showing uh, you know, the probe uh, uh, along the, the first trajectory. And so again, you can see uh, going kind of uh, bounces around a little bit, but you can see here, the corpus callosum is uh, this structure here. You can see the yellow as the tissue is starting to heat up. Uh, and then again, that will then uh, change to blue when that tissue is completely destroyed. Um, and so again, we uh, burn uh, um, a certain part of the tissue until uh, it's completely ablated. Then we pull the, the probe back a little bit and continue to heat it uh, until we get the, the entire uh, extent um, in that trajectory. And so there, the body of the corpus callosum was ablated. Now this is the second trajectory, and so now we're getting the anterior, the frontal part, which is the genu or the rostrum. And then now here, in, in this last one, we're looking at the images in the um, back part of the corpus callosum, which is the, the splenium, again, showing that that tissue being ablated. And so now in the, in the middle picture here, you can see how the three trajectories uh, then connect. And then uh, you see the, the blue lines all, all connect there, um, showing uh, the, uh, the, the completion of the corpus callosum. So again, we have to get it from different trajectories, but the idea is, if we're able to line it up properly, uh, then in the end, we're able to, to ablate the entire tissue. Um, and so again, this is an image afterwards showing uh, the, the three different trajectories and how they're all um, connecting. Uh, and then this is a, a post-operative uh, MRI uh, here, which shows uh, enhancement or brightness kind of around uh, the corpus callosum, showing that the entire thing has been, uh, has been ablated. Uh, so again, this was a, a, a nice way to be able to do what traditionally was done via an open craniotomy through three small, you know, four millimeter uh, incisions with a probe. Uh, and again, this, this patient was able to go home the next day. Uh, whereas with a, a standard craniotomy, typically patients would probably be in the hospital for, you know, almost a week, three to five days or, or up to a week, uh, depending on how they're doing. And so um, this is again, another, another nice uh, um, uh, minimally invasive uh, intracranial procedure that we can do uh, to help uh, get the seizure under better control for, for our patients with uh, these types of seizures.
Uh, so now I'm going to move, uh, move along to uh, talk about uh, neuromodulation. Um, and so as I mentioned before, neuro neuromodulation refers to lots of different uh, uh, devices that we have, including the RNS, uh, the VNS, and the DVS. So the RNS is a responsive uh, neurostimulator. Uh, the VNS is the vagus nerve stimulator. And the DBS is a deep brain stimulator. And so um, they all work uh, a little bit differently. So the RNS is uh, a device that's used to help uh, treat seizures when uh, the seizures are coming from a focal area. So a, a specific uh, location where it would have figured out where those seizures are coming from. Uh, but they're in an area that we can't uh, remove uh, safely, resect, um, or ablate um, uh, because potentially it would cause a, a significant neurologic deficit. So for example, if the seizures are coming from the motor area of the brain, uh, and so we know that if we re remove that, it would cause significant weakness, or if it was coming from the language area, and if we remove that, we would cause um, difficulty talking. Um, in, in those cases, since we can't remove it, then the idea is we can uh, place a permanent electrode uh, in that area, and then that's connected to a generator that then is recording the electrical activity uh, from that area. And so when it senses a seizure, specifically from that area, then it can send a signal uh, back to help stop, um, stop the seizure. Now, the, the vagus nerve stimulator is a more generalized treatment. So uh, the, the vagus nerve uh, is a nerve that uh, we find here on the side of the neck. It's between the carotid artery and the jugular vein. And so for this procedure, we make a little incision, uh, find the vagus nerve, and then again, connect it to a generator. And that generator is constantly sending uh, stimulation up, up to, to the brain. And that uh, helps decrease overall seizure on burden. Now, the DBS is a deep brain stimulator. And I'll go in a little bit more detail through all of these things again uh, as we go along. Uh, but for this procedure, we have two electrodes that are placed in the thalamus, uh, and then the wires are tunneled uh, underneath the skin, and it also gets uh, connected to a generator from the uh, that gets implanted under the, under the chest. And again, that's sending signals uh, throughout uh, throughout the day. And again, it's kind of a, a broad signal; it's not uh, uh, responding to to a specific uh, seizure, but it's just overall um, decreasing the, the seizure burden uh, um, uh, by set, by kind of resetting the, the brain. Uh, but it's not responding to a specific seizure. The RNS is the only one that's responding to specific seizures. And so, um, again, uh, you know, these devices, unfortunately, they're not, again, they're not curative procedures, but they, they help uh, decrease overall seizure burden. Uh, the, the VNS, um, and not all, not all of them are approved or FDA approved for, um, for pediatric patients. So really, the, the VNS is the only one that's approved for, for kids. Um, and it's approved for kids um, four years older or older. Um, and in general, uh, after uh, one year, uh, when they've done uh, randomized control trials in adults, they found about a, a 35, 37% uh, seizure reduction, or I'm sorry, 37% of patients have had about a 50% reduction in their seizures at, at one year. Uh, whereas with the RNS, uh, um, about 44% of patients at one year have about a 50% reduction. And then with the DBS, uh, again, you get about 43% uh, uh, of patients that have a 50% reduction in seizures. And so and I'll go over that in a little bit more detail as we move along. Um, so again, this is the, the RNS. The, uh, the company that makes it is Neuropace. This is a responsive uh, neurostimulator. Uh, this was approved uh, by the FDA uh, back in uh, 2013 uh, for adult patients with uh, uh, partial onset seizures who failed two or more seizure medications. So they have intractable uh, epilepsy. Uh, and then, um, you know, the, a group in New York has started to present some of the early uh, experience in pediatric patients. So although it's not FDA approved in kids, uh, there are centers, including ours, uh, that, that have implanted um, successfully uh, uh, several uh, RNSs and, and patients have done, uh, pediatric patients have done well with it. Um, so this is what the device looks like. Uh, so again, it's, uh, um, this is the, uh, the system here that's connected to electrodes um, here. And, it, and in order to, to uh, place the device, we actually have to remove a piece of the, the skull uh, to create a space for the device to sit within and implanted within, uh, within the cranium uh, there. So these are the, the different steps that we take to, to do the procedure. Um, so uh, you can see uh, initially, uh, I'm sorry, and there's two different uh, types of electrodes that we can uh, place with the RNS. So we can either place a depth electrode, similar to like the SEG electrodes that I showed earlier, or you can also place a strip uh, similar to like when we talk about the, the, the grids and the strips, a strip that goes directly on top on the surface of the, of the brain uh, tissue. So it all depends on where the seizures are coming from and what we're targeting. But this is uh, just showing um, uh, placing a depth electrode. So we make a, a, a small opening in the skull. 
uh, then we can uh, place the electrode down to target. And again, I use the, the ROSA, the ro robot, uh, to help plan the trajectory for, for these uh, lead placements. Uh, and then it gets secured to, to the skull with this little cap here. And you have the wire coming out from there. Um, and then uh, we have a template. And then we, we uh, then uh, demarcate the, uh, the extent of the, the bone that needs to remove um, in order to um, uh, uh, place the, the generator within the skull. Uh, and then we map out the, the incision um, of the skin. Uh, and then uh, we remove the, the bone. Uh, and then in this case, it's showing an example of uh, the electrode being placed over, this is another electrode that's being placed over the brain tissue. So that's a strip electrode there with the wire coming out. So again, you can do a combination of a depth electrode with a strip electrode. You can do uh, two strip electrodes or you can do two depth electrodes. But right now the device only has the capability of um, uh, gathering data and stimulating uh, two, two targets. So you can only have two electrodes uh, per, uh, per generator. Uh, and then uh, once the uh, leads are in place, uh, then we put uh, this tray um, uh, within the bone and then we place the, the generator um, within uh, that tray. And then we connect the, the wires to the, the RNS there and secure it. Uh, and then we uh, test the, the system. And then the abeltologist is typically in the, uh, in the operating room at this point, and they look at the uh, electrical activity and then see if they can see some spikes uh, from seizures to make sure that we're in the right, uh, in the right uh, space. And so once the, um, uh, the device is implanted, then initially uh, we turn on the device to record uh, data. And uh, because the device needs to learn what a seizure looks like for a particular patient. And so then we re we'll record data for, for some time. Uh, the patient will then follow up with the epileptologist. The, epilepto the, the data gets uh, uploaded into the cloud. The epileptologist is able to, to review that data and then is able to see what the electrical activity looks like for that particular patient when they're having seizures. And so then uh, once they determine that, then uh, in, in the office, then they can program it. And so whenever the device is sensing that electrical activity that's associated with that specific patient's uh, seizures, then it can uh, um, then program the device to send a signal uh, back to that area to help stop or, or, or shorten the, the, the seizure. So that's the responsive nature of this device. It's responding to the electrical activity and then helping to stop the, the seizures. Uh, so this is uh, what the uh, epileptologists look, like, look at. They're looking at um, electrical activity. And then as I talked about, this is a, a closed loop system uh, that's delivering a, a stimulation to the seizure onto its own, to where the seizure are coming, coming from. Um, and then in, in, in some patients, uh, 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 we can also use it just to, to determine uh, what part of the brain um, the seizures are coming from more. So there are some patients that have uh, multiple seizure onset zones, multiple areas where the seizures are coming from. So for example, there are some patients that have seizures coming from the temporal lobes, and sometimes it's coming from both temporal lobes. And uh, some patients may have an EEG or even depth electrodes placed, um, but the seizures don't happen frequently enough enough for the epileptologist to really determine whether there's more seizures coming from the right side or more seizures coming from the left side. So some centers have even used this to help uh, do like a long-term uh, EEG recording of the, the seizures so that then over time they can figure out whether more seizures are coming from one side or the other because then that could then determine whether that patient would be a candidate for um, a, a, an ablation or a resection or, or something else or whether the RNS itself is then used to, to treat the, the seizures uh, by sending that, that signal. So. It can also act, act, as it says here, as a long-lasting uh, in, uh, invasive uh, EEG uh, so that we can see you know, where the seizures are coming from and, and how often the seizures are coming from specific areas. And as I mentioned before, um, this device is uh, currently not FDA approved uh, for, for children, although um, you know, uh, many centers uh, throughout the country are, are implanting these devices in kids and, and have had um, good seizure outcomes uh, so far. Um, so uh, currently, uh, most of the uh, Currently, the, the, the data uh, that we have is, is in adults, uh, but we have seen that, um, uh, like most uh, neuromodulation devices, uh, the, the seizures uh, improve the longer the device is in place. Um, so here we can see um, uh, that at one year, uh, they saw uh, approximately 44% reduction seizures, uh, whereas at two years, they saw a 53% a, a reduction. So every year going up a little bit, this is from uh, um, uh, uh, one study done back in 2014. Uh, and then, uh, then there's uh, this other study looked at seizures at between three to six years. And then you can see that at that point, they're getting about a 60 to 66% reduction in seizures. And then uh, in this study, um, uh, looking at nine years, there's approximately 75% reduction in seizures. So again, it shows that over time, uh, as a device uh, better learns what the seizures look like, we get a better improvement in seizure uh, control. 
Um, now the surgery, obviously like any surgery has risk. The, the more common things that we see are infection, um, but that's typically only seen in, in less than 5%. Uh, you can have some, uh, bleeding, um, and that's also seen in less than 5%. Uh, and then sometimes the, the leads themselves can get damaged uh, over time uh, and, and, uh, or at placement. And so that's something we have to watch out for as well. Although that risk is also uh, fairly small. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a group in, uh, in New York that did uh, describe their initial uh, experience in the pediatric uh, 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 population. Um, they looked at 27 patients, uh, pediatric patients who had RNS placed um, from 2015 to 2019. Uh, and then they, they did see that um, all of the patients uh, showed um, improvement in their seizure. Uh, approximately half of those patients saw between a 75 uh, to 100 percent reduction in seizure frequency. So pretty good uh, outcomes there. Um, and uh, about a third saw between uh, 25 uh, to 75 percent reduction in seizures. Um, they did see a, a, a handful of infections, uh, but they had no other major uh, complication. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the vagus nerve stimulator. So again, this is the device that I talked about earlier. Uh, uh, that we uh, implant uh, in the chest and the neck, uh, left side of the neck. Um, so again, uh, you can see the, the vagus nerve here. Uh, the, the wire for the VNS has three little coils. And so during surgery, we dissect that nerve um, um, and then we uh, wrap the three little coils around the nerve and then we tunnel the, uh, the wire under the skin and then we create a little pocket in the chest area uh, just over the muscle um, for, for the generator itself. Um, and the VNS is similar to, to pacemaker. So again, as I mentioned before, the device is sending a signal up to the brain throughout the day. Uh, and the idea is it kind of uh, resets the brain to hopefully help decrease the overall seizure, um, seizure uh, burden. Um, but it's essentially sending uh, pulses all day, every day um, uh, uh, to, to help um, control the seizures. Um, the VNS obviously helps to decrease seizure activity, uh, seizure intensity. Uh, and then uh, many of our patients also um, note that they have a quicker recovery time after the seizure. So um, they don't seem to be postictal as, as long. Um, and then as, uh, as we saw with the RNS, uh, we also see that with the VNS, the longer it's in, implanted, uh, the, the better seizure control we get. So um, each column here is, represents a different study. So uh, this is one study looking at 269 patients. And uh, this is looking at uh, data at one year. This is looking at data at two years. This is almost three years, almost four years, and then almost five years. And so then you can see that um, in this uh, study here, comparing the one year to two year, they didn't change any of the medications. Uh, and so they saw that at, the, at one year, they saw about a 57% of patients um, had greater than 50% reduction in seizures. And then at two years, that, that number went up to 64%. Now, in these studies, they didn't control for medication. So part of this could be related to the VNS or part of the data could be related to changing medications. But again, they saw that over time, you know, at three years, four years, five years, we saw an increase in number of patients um, that had greater than 50% seizure uh, frequency reduction. So again, the longer it's in, typically the, the, better, uh, the better it works. Um, now, the VNS, uh, obviously, like with any surgery, also has side effects. Um, it's pretty well tolerated. Um, don't have many patients uh, that have um, significant problems or issues, but one of the things that we see is sometimes you can have a little bit of hoarseness in voice, and sometimes the, the voice sounds a little bit robotic. Um, sometimes it can cause a little bit of a cough. Um, sometimes uh, 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 you can have a little bit of difficulty swallowing, but typically even if the patients that have these symptoms, typically the symptoms resolve um, pretty, um, uh, pretty quickly, and they don't seem to be long-term. Um, so patients tol tol tolerate this procedure pretty well. Um, this is again just showing a, 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 what, what the device looks like with the wire and the generator and the, and, and the uh, chest. Um, and then the device works uh, three different ways. So one is that we program it so it's sending a, a pulse or a signal up to the brain throughout the day. So when we first implant it, it's sending a signal um, for 30 seconds every five minutes uh, throughout the entire day. So you're getting hundreds uh, of these pulses throughout the day. Um, in addition to that, uh, uh, patients will have a magnet. So when patients have a cluster of seizures, lots of seizures back to back, um, or um, if they have a very long seizure, uh, you have a magnet that you can swipe over the device and then that can send a, a, a pulse at that time. And then sometimes that's able to um, help stop or shorten the, the seizure as well. In addition to that, we know that 82% of patients with, uh, with epilepsy um, have a, an increase in their heart rate um, before the seizure even occurs. And so if the device um, can detect your heart rate and if it notices a, a, 
a, a significant increase in the heart rate, um, then it will send an extra pulse at that time. And sometimes that's, that's able to help uh, stop or, or shorten the seizures as well. So uh, it's working three different, three different ways. Um, there's different models for, for the, um, for the uh, VNS. This is the older model, this is the 106. Uh, this is the newer, the newest model that we have is the, the 1000. And this is what the, the generator itself looks like. And then this is the tablet with the programmer uh, that we use uh, to, to change the settings. Uh, when we first implant the device, we, we turn it on in the operating room. Uh, and, then, uh, and then typically I, I will see patients back about a week or two afterwards. As long as everything is uh, going okay, then we'll increase the setting a little bit. Uh, and then we'll program it so it automatically goes up about once a week uh, over several weeks. Uh, and then it typically takes a few months to get up to the therapeutic level. But just like with medications, uh, we want to uh, make sure that patients aren't having side effects and that they're tolerating it okay. Uh, and so uh, once um, uh, we get to the therapeutic level, uh, then we'll, we'll leave it at that, at that setting. But there's lots of different things that we can change. We can change how strong the signal is, how frequently the, the, the device goes off, uh, and things like that. So typically, the optologist will manage that to help optimize the, the seizure uh, control as, as best as possible. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about the deep brain uh, stimulator. So again, uh, this device uh, is uh, at this point just FDA approved for adults. It was just approved uh, last year. Um, and uh, for the DBS, uh, there's a couple of different targets in the brain that, that people have, have used uh, to help treat seizures. Uh, uh, most common targets are in the thalamus. Uh, and the, the, the big study that was done that, that led to the FDA approval um, uh, was a Sante trial. And they were look, looking at electrodes that were placed in the anterior a thalamic uh, nucleus. And so again, with the DBS, we have, uh, we make two openings in the skull, uh, place electrodes all the way down to, um, to the target, which is typically in the thalamus. And then we tunnel a wire under the, um, the skin and then we connect it to a generator that's implanted in the, um, in the chest here. Uh, and so again, this is just uh, um, some images of the, the brain. And then we can see the thalamus has different um, uh, parts uh, to it. And the, um, uh, the, 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 the main target is the anterior thalamic nucleus, although other people have tar targeted the central median nucleus, uh, uh, and then there's some other targets as well that people have been, have been looking at. Um, now, again, with uh, DBS, uh, in terms of outcomes, uh, typically, uh, well, th this one study showed that there was about a 40% uh, uh, decrease in seizure activity after three months, uh, comparing uh, to placebo, which only uh, showed about a 15% decrease. Uh, and then uh, again, looking at up to seven years, they saw about a 75% uh, uh, reduction in, in seizures. So again, it's not, uh, it's not curative, uh, but for patients that don't have a focal area that can be resected or ablated or treated, uh, this could be uh, another alternative uh, to help uh, get the seizures under, under uh, better control. So I know I talked about a lot of different things, including uh, SEG, uh, laser ablation, RNS, uh, DBS, um, and VNS. Um, uh, Again, th this only uh, is touching upon some of the things that we can do, but uh, you know, the, the idea is that um, you know everybody is is, is different, and so uh, we have to get gather uh, data, um, including the uh, the VTM, the MRI, the PET scan, um, uh, and all these other neuropsychiatric testing and all these other um, tests to assess if somebody is a good uh, surgical candidate. And if they are, then we can talk about what these uh, what what um, potential treatment options uh, we can offer. So. Um, the, the, the nice thing is that we do have some, uh, um, some more options that are less invasive. Uh, you know, patients don't, uh, obviously surgery is, is scary and we want to try to make it uh, um, as uh, at least scary as, as, as possible, obviously, and, and, and make it as safe as possible. And so the nice thing is we, we do have all these different technologies to, to, to help um, do that. Um, so in conclusion, we have lots of different uh, surgical uh, treatment options to help control um, uh, epilepsy. Uh, there's lots of new technical, technological advances. Um, uh, we, we also know that the earlier uh, we, we do surgery, um, the, the better seizure outcome uh, we, we will get. So that's why it's always important to start thinking about uh, surgical treatment options early on, uh, because the, the longer seizures are, 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 are in place, the harder it is to control. So we want to be um, as aggressive as possible to get seizures under control. And then we also know, um, you know that, that surgery obviously has risks and it's, it's scary, but um, uh, but that there's also risk of not controlling the seizure and there's the risk of SUDEP. And so that's always in the back of our minds. And so that's why we're always wanting to get the seizures under control as best as possible. Uh, so uh, again, if seizures are not controlled uh, um, with uh, any tried two or more seizure medications, you uh, really should be referred to a level four epilepsy center to, help, uh, to discuss um, potential surgical uh, treatment options because 
there may be something that we could do to get seizure under under better control. So uh, thank you for um, for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. All right, good. I'm not hearing any questions. Actually, Aliza, do you mind um, just saying something to make sure I, I can actually hear? In case you're asking a question. I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys for, for listening. Um, enjoy the rest of the, the lectures. <laughs>